Hello, I'm John William Hulskamp, author of Friends of the Wigwam, and you are watching Author's Voice. Welcome to Author's Voice, connecting authors to the world. This program is A House Divided, and I am your host, Bjorn Skaffison. Welcome to A House Divided today. Uh, I'll be your host for today's show. Today, the book we are talking about is Friends of the Wigwam, a Civil War Story, brought to us by Barrington Group Publishers. The cost for this book is $16.95. And we thank Barrington Group for everything they did to help produce this uh, book and bring, uh, uh, get our author to us today. Our author is John William Hulescamp, and we're going to meet John in just a second, but thank you for coming to the show, John. Thank you. Uh, for folks at home, if you are watching on Facebook Live or on our website, please use the comments section to ask questions. I would just as soon ask your questions than mine. I'm sure yours are better than mine. So ask questions, It'll either go into our Facebook feed, you can put it right there in the Facebook feed, or leave a question at authorsvoice.net. You have a chance to do that. Ask the author a question, he'd be happy to answer it for you. Um, most importantly, order the book. Selling these books is why we're able to have these shows and uh, bring these authors to you. And you get a chance to get signed first editions and build a fine signed first edition library, in this case of a Civil War book. Uh, people out there that collect Civil War will want something like that. Now our author today, John William Hulescamp. John is a historical novelist whose early passion for the Civil War history was ignited when he discovered a cavalry saber in the Maryland woods near his boyhood home. I almost want to hear that <laughs> story instead of the, but. Um, John has been fascinated with the Civil War ever since then. An avid research historian, John is a consultant to Civil War scholars of all kinds. He was appointed an honorary board member for the General Longstreet Memorial Project at Gettysburg National Military Park, and continues to promote Civil War legacy through monuments, museums, battlefield preservation, teaching, so on and so forth, all of this valuable activity that John does. John, welcome to Author's Voice. Welcome to House Divided. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks for the nice introduction. Sure. First off, just like we said, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I guess you'd probably consider me and others uh, children of the centennial of the American Civil War. Uh, at the age of eight is when the centennial began in April of 1961, and uh, so for four formative years, I mean, at a very young age, I fell in love. You mentioned the cavalry saber was a shock. I, I started to start collecting little things, baseball cards, uh, centennial cards, uh, on the Civil War. They, they looked like baseball cards, but they had you know, the imagery of, of various battles. Uh, with that, I, at the age of 13, I moved out of Maryland and, and didn't return until my mid-20s settling mostly in Illinois and realizing that the, the pomp and circumstance and the celebrations that I knew in Washington, D.C., I was on the Maryland side of the Potomac River, not a lot of that out here. And from what uh, I learned over the 30 years of uh, researching and, uh, and writing this book is that a lot of upper Midwest states don't realize the incredible uh, mission and activity and the warring that went on uh, to bring the, the fruition of the Civil War to, to what Abraham Lincoln wanted and the rest of the folks in Illinois. Victory and uh, the defeat of the South. Mm -hmm. That is it in a nutshell. Um, you know, I, there are other things that I have done along the way besides collecting artifacts. I've contacted uh, Keith Rocco, for instance, whose painting is on the cover Terrific of the book. Terrific artist, wonderful Civil War artist. I actually selected the 93rd Illinois and Colonel Putnam incident at Tunnel Hill, which is the climax of the book, 
to be kind of the centerpiece of what was to come in terms of telling the story in Illinois and the upper Midwest. Um, the painting was completed in 1993. I had spent five trips to the uh, Missionary Ridge Battlefield Tunnel Hill sector and uh, collected data before the internet, as you know, we had to mm -hmm. go to libraries, go to historical societies. We had to walk these places and talk to people, local historians who lived there. So with that, uh, the painting was first uh, in 93. I then wrote an article for Civil War Regiments, which was accepted uh, as a notable uh, regimental series book. At that point, um, I started thinking bigger and talking to historians who thought that a novel that was in a reader section of a library would be probably the best way to communicate a story uh, like previous stories, Gone with the Wind. I'm not mm -hmm. Margaret Mitchell by any <laughs> means, uh, but Michael Shera, who sure. wrote the, uh, Margaret Angel. Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, mm -hmm. uh, Michael with, Shera with um, Killer Angels that became a movie, mm -hmm. and things started to snowball at that point. Uh, we are now uh, in the process of, of putting a movie script together. Interesting. With, um, a great writer, his name, he could not be here today. Uh, he wrote Hoosiers, his name is Angelo Pizzo, and he also did Rudy, very heartfelt movies that many of us have seen, Wonderful and I movies. wanted that type of writer to capture the story of the personages in this book. Well, there's so, m there's so many personages in the book. I mean, that, that's a great way to bring it up. This book has a very local feel. To it and the characters spring from a particular time and place and it's around northern Illinois before and during the Civil War what may, but what makes their story what makes the story of all these people take on a how does it make it interesting to the world at large because it's a story that goes everywhere it's a great great question the the concept of what area to pick in the upper Midwest was actually suggested by the late John Y. Simon from Southern Illinois, who's a grant editor and scholar. He had told me that the area from Galena, Illinois, crossing to Freeport, then into Chicago, was comparable in the Revolutionary War to the Hudson River in terms of political importance and strategy. You know, there were eight generals out of Galena. Yes. And then, of course, uh, we have um, Eli Parker, who's in the book came from western New York. Uh, others in Chicago were Elmer Ellsworth, the first Union officer ca uh, casualty in the Civil War. And, and most importantly, though, um, we have an individual named Albert D.J. Cashier from Belvedere, which is the Rockford area, who was born in Clogger Head, Ireland in 1843, uh, female biological gender, okay? She masqueraded during the, prior to the Civil War and during the Civil War and after the Civil War mm -hmm. and pulled off some amazing uh, just patriotism She really is one means. of the most compelling yeah, I, figures of Illinois, not just your book, but of Illinois history. And also I think national history. Mm -hmm. there, are very, there are women that enlisted in the Civil War, um, but there are only three that we're aware of that successfully masqueraded, one in your home state, Kansas. Mm -hmm. But uh, the unique thing about Albert D.J. Cashier, who is the heart and soul of this book, uh, is that she survived under incredible circumstances, 42 skirmishes, but the major battles, pretty much unknown to many Americans in detail, are Vicksburg, Nashville, and Franklin. All Civil War historians know that those were brutal battles, to go through one of them is remarkable. Uh, Vicksburg being compared a lot of, to Gettysburg, right? but Nashville as well. So it all came together as why not pick up these people, these personages that sur some survived the war, some didn't, go back in time a little bit and put them younger on the Pecatonica River so that you can get a feel for, and of course there's creative license there, but I have all these uh, children, as the book opens up, 
uh, having a lot of fun on that river, learning that this impending war was coming. Uh, eventually, the four boys, and of course, the, the two girls, one of them is Albert D.J. Cashier, before she enlisted, and the other is the uh, daughter of Colonel Putnam. They're having a grand old time for four years. They even see a Lincoln Douglas Labate in Freeport. And to kind of merge all this then with known characters like Grant, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and for many Illinois, Elihu Washburn, uh, I brought it together, uh, both the, I would say, the adult focus and strategy in the war and the children's concerns merged right with the enlistment that they did in uh, uh, the fall of 1862. They went to war, some came back, some didn't. Mm -hmm. But the, there's a moral element to the story also as to what was truly going on. What do you think of a patriot in Illinois or any northern state, we, a Union patriot? Who were those people? There's not a lot in the history books. It's all sided mostly to the east of the Appalachians where I was raised. And uh, now here we have an opportunity to get more exposure, get that limelight with the painting, the book, and now this movie coming out, uh, probably in a two to three year time frame. We want to be very detailed to capture not only the detail, uh, it's a little redundant there, but the spirit of the book. And this, but most importantly, the spirit of the story of these people as we know looking back. Right. Now. now I want to ask you about your characters because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any of your characters are made up. Uh, They're all, every, that, but every one of them is, is a historical figure, although some of them are famous and well-drawn, while others you had plenty of uh, an empty vessel to fill up mm -hmm. with character. How did you wrestle with that problem, taking someone you didn't know as a historical person and investing them with, with character, with feelings, with motivations, and all the things that go into telling a story? That's an excellent question. There's also a horse in here. That's and a horse. very important. Um, after collecting the characters and knowing how important they were, the, the idea is, do I write a book, uh, a typical book that's going to collect dust? in a library on the shelf. I mean, there's many of those out there, but the important thing in a novel is to get the, um, not only the characters developed in the right way, but to, you know, have creative license for the dialogue too. So a short answer to the question would be that I had to look at the actual individual's ages, step it back to 1857, capture how old they were, because it varied between 13 and uh, 16, and just put them out there and have some fun with them. You'll find that the wigwam, which the book is uh, named after, ties to an Indian wigwam that was discovered where they all hang out, almost like a, well, it's a cave or a tree fort mm -hmm. where they met and had fun, fished. Um, sauntered around in the water, you know, and, and things like that. Um, the end goal, though, is to get them to war and how to do that. And I followed strictly the chronology of what uh, went on, including the Republican Convention is in there. The, uh, at the wigwam? At the wigwam, which is the oh, other wigwam. Yeah, the other wigwam. The adult wigwam. <laughs> so that is the, uh, I guess, double entendre mm -hmm. for the book. Mm -hmm bringing it together. The wigwam is not about, uh, there is one Native American, Eli Parker in it, but some people think that this is an Indian era right. book. It, it's intentionally done to bring the children on the river together with the adults in a very um, nice, I think, way. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, I don't know if I've said that enough. In this video. <laughs> Welcome to Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. That's where Author's Voice comes to you from. We have artifacts, or at least when we talk about a Civil War book, we have artifacts. And I was thrilled when I saw the book, and I saw that you were writing about Albert D.J. Cashier, uh, to know that I had something, we have something in the shop now, that relates to Albert's regiment, the 95th 
95th Illinois Regiment. A lot of this is about the 93rd Illinois Regiment. This is the 95th from Rockford, that area. Yes, so it's definitely. northern Illinois. And here is a quarter plate albumin photo. Let me get that. Let me get that of Alonzo Brooks. That's Lieutenant Alonzo Brooks of Company K of the 95th Regiment Illinois Volunteers. Now this is this sort of drives home the idea that Albert's a real person. And here's one of her comrades, and even as he's being photographed here for this uh, lovely, you know, albumin quarter plate, he doesn't know that one of his comrades is exactly. is a woman. And uh, but uh, so what this leads me to is your regiments are also characters, mm -hmm. groups of people yes. can be characters. And so the 95th is not the 93rd, and the 93rd is not the 95th. They have different right. people in them, and they have different ways about them. Uh, how did how did these communities sort of inform your your ability to tell the story and carry these characters through the war? Are you referring to living people? Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they people were like wonderful. Alonzo, you know. Are you talking about the historical societies themselves or the, Alonzo? the regiments? Themselves. The regiments themselves. Yes, uh, again, chronologically, obviously from one up to the 186 regiments that were from Illinois and the 250,000 uh, soldiers that went down there. What I did is I simply followed um, who was the first, the 45th Il Illinois is from Galena. There are letters there with General John E. Smith, and, and I won't get into a lot of detail there, but they were the first to appear in the book in a battle, followed by the 93rd Illinois, which is uh, Colonel Putnam, and most of the character boys on the river followed by the 95th Illinois, which is where Alonzo and also, uh, but more importantly, Albert D.J. Cashier were from. In the development of this, fortunately, I guess by luck and by research, I found out that they were on a famous charge on May 22nd, uh, where they were on the uh, Vicksburg battlefield. The 45th was the first to fight, fight out that, the siege battle on that date, followed by the uh, 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 95th Illinois in the middle, center, followed by the 93rd Illinois, in a sequence of roughly one hour and a half. We've got all of this hell breaking loose, excuse the word, mm -hmm. with the characters in the book. So the reader is now re realizing that although they're not connected because they're in separate regiments, they're all going through a major sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So that, I hope, answers that question. Yeah, they're question. all at the same time in the same place. Or, or to put it very simply, in The Killer Angels, yes. suddenly everybody knew what the 20th Maine Regiment was. And exactly. they knew all this stuff about exactly. it. And these regiments also give you 45th, 93rd, 95th, give you groups that can become familiar to the reader as real people, not a numeral, not uh, a mark mm -hmm. on a map. Uh, and I think that's very valuable. I think it's a very valuable thing to do when you do this, Agreed. In this book. Um, now, let me see where, where, where we have so much, having so much fun just talking about the, talking about the book. Uh, but we were talking before, the, uh, before we started uh, this program that a lot of people in Illinois, and a lot of what you do outside of writing the book is teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not a teacher by profession, but you spend a lot of time, you're telling me, going out to schools and teaching and teaching to the public. And it is probably true, uh, present company excluded, and probably present company, the people that are bothering to watch this <laughs> excluded, but it's probably true that generally speaking, people in Illinois, people in northern Illinois, don't know enough about the Civil War history of their region. And you told me some very interesting ideas you had about why you thought that this might be so. Can you share some of that with us? Sure. There's, from what I gather, and, and speaking with other historians um, of note, they, it's really three things. Okay, first of all, Illinois uh, be, was incorporated in 1818. That means that those soldiers that were on the average age of 20, okay, this was the first generation of Illinois citizen, citizens that 
men mostly, that ended up going to war as a first generation of each state. You look at uh, the New England, for instance, goes back well over 200 years. So there's a history there um, going back multiple wars. This was actually the first major war, if you exclude the Black Hawk War, where nothing was really fought. But uh, people don't realize that, that th this uh, occurred because there are not a lot of battlefield dead. You know, Gardner, in terms of pictures, Gardner mm -hmm. and um, Brady took many pictures of Antietam and Gettysburg. So the first thing, I think pictorially, the reason is that uh, there are no pictures in, in history books going back of battlefield dead in the West. Everyone identifies, as I did, until I did more research, that the biggest battles were in the East. They were on both sides of the Appalachians. So the first thing is photography. The second thing is the Homestead Act. I mentioned earlier the young soldiers okay, coming yes. back from war. If the Homestead Act of 1862 uh, was passed, which gave 160 acres of land to any citizen okay, that did not fight against the United States of America. Even women could, could qualify for that. So my ancestor, one of my great-great-grandfathers, took it up. At the end of the war, he got 160 acres in, in Nebraska. So many of these young soldiers said, why should I go back and work on dad's farm or mom's farm? I'm going to get my own land out west. So with that goes the verbal uh, or oral tradition of history out there. It's more decimate, uh, dispersed over Kansas territory, Nebraska, Oklahoma, right. and all that. So you got the... I think the battlefield, no, no battlefield photography out here to show the horrors of what was going on west of the Appalachians, mm -hmm. Nashville, Franklin, Vicksburg, sure. the rest. Uh, thirdly, I call it the old uh, Eastern Press, which we're familiar with. Do people read the New York Times or the Chicago Sun Times or the Chicago Tribune more? Who does America lean to in general is typically the Eastern Press. Washington Post, all the way up the line to the right. Boston Globe. That being the case, no doubt, right after the war, all the articles perhaps were cited to the Eastern campaigns, Robert E. Lee included for the South, leaving the Western armies uh, with, with not a lot of coverage on, on the print side, mm -hmm. not a lot of recognition. Uh, you probably know that the vast majority of children's books historically have come out of the East Coast, um, even the North Carolina press, sure. not the Illinois press. So those yeah, three things. Th three, three excellent reasons why we, don't, why we don't see a lot of coverage of this very important, that very important region. Now, one of the best things I like about this book is this book is can tell that you're a collector yes. by reading this book. This book is filled with primary source references, and not just references, you give us pictures of some of your sources. You give us quoting fully from some of the battle orders and things like that, uh, some of the primary sources that you had access to. The primary sources seem to drive along the story. If we're going to hear the story of General John E. Smith, we see a letter that he wrote, an order that was given him that that drives the story on to the next uh, uh, the next step. How do you use? Uh, tell us a little bit how you wanted to use, or why you wanted to use these primary sources. The same thing you would use in a scholarly history. You stuck them in the middle of your story to drive that along. I thought I think that's a brilliant idea. Well, it wasn't mine. Guess who, who it was? <laughs> uh, Somebody you know very well in this building. Oh, uh, yeah? Dan. Dan, Dan Weinberg, Weinberg, the owner of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. In I told him that I had the good fortune as I, of meeting um, an individual named uh, Kirby Smith, who's the great-great-grandson yeah. of John E. Smith, who has the uh, major collection uh, that will probably end up in a museum someday, yeah. of um, letters that to and from Grant, from John E. Smith, uh, but mostly the letters that went 
to his wife, Amy, were so heartfelt that I figured, well, let's put these in. And these I'll are just in write. Private collection, right? Private collection. This, this is the, the first, first time, time you've seen these letters. Anybody this is the first time ever yeah. published. I decided to write the story around the letter as well. So you'd have Johnny Smith late at night in his tent pulling out a pen, uh, and then bam, you have the, the actual letter that he did write on that specific day down in that Mississippi swamp or whatever it was. But to validate that, I decided to put at the end of each chapter a photograph of it to show that it was, it's the real deal. So my goal here is to get people to research these things even deeper, to kind of pick something out of the book that you like, whether it's an artifact, a letter, uh, and, and find out who these people were and what they did. There are many, many of these letters uh, in collections across America. And, and quite frankly, the 93rd Illinois Diary um, or the regimental history was, came from a diary down in Princeton, where I used some of that too, accessible at, at most of these small historical societies across America, mm -hmm. I mean, across Illinois. Yeah. Well, I, I, think it was, uh, uh, I, I think it was an inspired choice on your part to listen to the advice <laughs> of Dan Weinberg, because it really, it really does some great things for the way that this book is told. Now, uh, something that you mentioned right at the yes. top is this project started simply with a, uh, a, a, a project with you and the great uh, Keith painter, Rocco. Yeah. Keith Rocco, to paint, to get a painting of this dramatic scene. And it is the scene that shows up on the cover of the book. And I think we've seen the cover of the book before, but there it is. There's Colonel Putnam, there's Colonel Putnam going up the hill at Missionary Ridge. And the folks at home can see a, a close-up of, of Keith Rocco's painting, which is the cover of the book. You're a collector. And so you've brought some artifacts with us today. You brought some artifacts that you can share with us today, both of which contributed materially to the creation of this remarkable painting that yeah. Keith did in 1993. So can you tell us about a couple of these pieces? Let's, Let's start with the collection of uh, Cartes de Visite. Do you want me to hold it like yeah. this? Yeah, well, let's let's uh, find a camera to look at it, and I'll get this book out of your way. There you go. And there, the folks at home can see. Uh, uh, I can stand it up can a little. See these? Just yeah. And there's a there's uh, this this <laughs> photograph album that you have. Filled with carts de visite. And they're carts de visite of enlisted of soldiers from the 93rd Illinois. Tell us a little bit how you came to find this and what role it plays in the creation of the painting in the book. Well, Keith Rocco is, is a world-renowned, uh, they call him a realism painter. Right? So anything that he does has to be meticulous in terms of detail. I mean, he told me, I'm not going to do the painting unless you find out what the color of Putnam's horse the flag tips on the flags that are supposed, you know, are, were, were carried up the hill. And again, I was very fortunate to, to be able to acquire the 93rd Illinois photo album I just showed you, which uh, we then took their faces. Two of them that I just showed you are actually, if you want to hold the book up. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hold it up for you and you can, you can talk. Okay. Yeah. so. This individual at the tree was the, the individual you saw to the right um, in, in the book here, mm -hmm. I mean the album. This is, uh, and his name is uh, Sergeant Major Trimble. Uh, this individual looking up is Captain Taggart, who is a best friend of Colonel Putnam. Uh, and then over here is, uh, we didn't show you the picture, but he, there's an individual walking or making his way down the hill holding his elbow because he, is, he was the first color barrier to be shot. Uh, and then we have Lieutenant Hicks here holding the flag. He was actually shot across the, the forehead and that's why he's depicted uh, handing, finally, unfortunately for Putnam, he was um, uh, shot off his horse and was killed advancing up the hill. 
these flags at the top, there's a lot of, uh, you notice when you look, well, it's, you can't really see it very well, but those are blue flags with a white moon. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, the that, that's, Hardy flag. that's the Hardy flag from the West. Uh, most people would never know that, but we wanted to get everything captured here in the right way. The positioning of the troops, uh, the advancement, the timber, everything. And so we, we were very fortunate to have all these small uh, historical societies in Princeton running up to Freeport, Stevenson County, help us dig up, even with the sword where Captain uh, uh, Taggart has mm -hmm. in the picture. So. Right. And then that, this brings us to one other article, yes. but, it's, but also before we bring to this, to this last uh, artifact, it, what's so fascinating about the book, this starts as a collecting project. The yes. collecting project leads into an art project, a cooperation between you and Keith Rocco. And then when the painting is done, you say, I need to tell this, I need to create a story out of this. And then that ultimately leads to the book that we have right now. It's, it's really a... Uh, an incredible story of creative synergy, you know, mm -hmm. leading from one idea, well, and it's, it's leading somewhere else. Well, I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but let's look at the because let's look at the at the piece de piece de la resistance, if that's what well, we want to call it. Well, since you know uh -huh. Loomis better than I do with John our discussion here, I want you to introduce him. Oh, oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we have field glasses, right? Binocular. Mm -hmm field glasses, and uh, John found these years ago on, on the market, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it says on them, John Mason Loomis of the 26th Illinois Regiment. Now, John Mason Loomis is the colonel of the, was the colonel of the 26th Illinois Regiment, also a brigade commander in Sherman's army, and the commander of the brigade to which belonged Colonel Holden Putnam's 93rd uh, Illinois Regiment at the Battle of Missionary Ridge, the Battle of Tunnel Hill, as uh, part of the Battle of Missionary Ridge. Colonel Loomis, uh, as you will find in the book, <laughs> dramatized in the book, uh, makes an, uh, let's call it an ill-considered order to send this regiment up the hill uh, with very little support and just to try to take this, this, this fiery crest of, of Missionary Ridge. And the 93rd Illinois Regiment is cut to pieces and Colonel Holden Putnam killed, shot off his horse and killed. And what we were talking about today, the whole thing, you, you showed us the whole, that whole scene was watched by Colonel Loomis through Those glasses. these glasses. Through these glasses that sat next to you while you were writing the story. Of, and indeed, uh, as we discussed earlier, the point of view of Keith's uh, painting, of Keith Rocco's painting, is exactly what Loomis would have been seeing if you looked through these glasses to watch that regiment go up that flaming crest and watch those men get shot down. With 21st century eyes. With 21st right. century <laughs> eyes. It, um, this is what an artifact can do for you. This is what an artifact can open up in your mind, a, a piece of historical artifact. That's what I think as a dealer of this stuff. I don't, and now you tell me what you think about your amazing <laughs> field glasses from Colonel John Mason. Lee. Well, you covered it all. <laughs> um, he, uh, in the book, is a... Uh, an arch, not enemy of. Um, has to be an uh, antagonist. Yeah, he's an point. antagonist. There has to be an antagonist. Yeah, yeah and and uh, makes uh, the decision not only to send Putnam up the hill, but uh, some Pennsylvania regiments that were stranded up there first. That was the initial problem. Putnam came for the rescue and then uh, went to his demise. But um, the late Wiley Sword, you know him. Oh yeah, great was a, a author. Good, a good friend of mine mm -hmm. and gave me a lot of mentorship, coaching. He told me that an artifact is a window in time, okay. a window in time, and we are the curators of that window in time. And so it, it really struck me uh, 25 years ago uh, to the core when he said that. And I, you know, so collecting artifacts is, is something where it, it's, most collectors are not hoarding stuff, you know. They, they want the word to get out right. on what these things do. And, of course, the Abraham Lincoln bookstore here is, has been around the longest that I know, doing that years. extremely well. So, in a nutshell, I, I, you know, when I talked to you today about this, I thought it was kind of interesting that when we looked over and you asked me, well, this is exactly what Loomis was looking at, correct? And mm -hmm. I said, in 21st century eyes. So... Um, 
That is it. Yeah. yeah, really great pieces, really great pieces. Now, uh, we're not going to talk too much more about the book because it's a novel and you need to buy it and read it to get the story. But we know you've told us that uh, Albert D.J. Cashier plays a major role in it. Elmer Ellsworth is very important in this. And uh, our friend Mr. Lincoln shows up and we get to visit the, some of the debates mm -hmm. and all st sorts of stuff like that happen. It creates uh, a, a really rich pageant that the fictional story tells you through and that's why you need to buy the book. John will sign it, we'll ship it out to you at home. Um, so, but departing from the book, fill us in on something you've hinted at a little bit before. What, what else do you have planned for this story? What's the next step for Friends of the Wind? Well, we thought a three-pronged approach, you know, they, they say a painting's worth a thousand words. Well, that was done first. Now, the book is obviously 386 pages, but if the word gets out on it, that's a lot of people talking about this, this uh, U.S. history uh, limelight project for not only Illinois, but all these northern Illinois states that, that are in the dark. So it's going to shed light on that. And, and nationally, I think the movie script that would come out, uh, since we have a very good and excellent, well-known um, screenwriter with Angelo Pizzo, if you want to look him up um, on Wikipedia, you'll see that his uh, Hoosier... Uh, Hoosier's a brilliant movie. His Hoosier screenplay is in the Smithsonian Institute right now. That's how important he is to uh, America, America's psyche. Um, so we are hoping that with his help and his genius that the story gets out and people start looking more uh, not only at the regiments but individually at Eli Parker, a Native American who, by the way, si uh, drafted the surrender documents when Robert E. Lee saw him uh, standing next to Grant McLean, Virginia. He went up to Eli and said, you know, it's good to see a real American. And Eli said, we are all Americans. So, uh, and then of course, Elmer Ellsworth, who you mentioned, uh, very solid uh, citizen, not only for the Midwest, but uh, uh, for, for America. So uh, the next step is to get things moving. I, I'm doing a lot of, um, presentations to elementary schools uh, to try to get, as I was influenced at a very young age, from 8 to 12 during the centennial, uh, I got hooked at, mm -hmm. at the average age of 10. So the next project we also have uh, coming out with Dwight John Zimmerman, who is a famous author uh, of children's books. He's in, in the process of writing um, a, the 10-year-old young adult version of this. Which okay. would exclude more the exclude the uh, chapters that are too technical, we feel, but also including pictorials, and having a, a nice bigger book to right. uh, to get out there. Mm -hmm. All right. In, in that case, the uh, then then uh, your field glasses can be the <laughs> saber in the woods for the next kid. Uh, yeah, absolutely, they, absolutely. They get to see it and they get to hold it when you bring it to one of their schools. Well, John, thank you much. Thank you so much for coming down here and talking about Friends of the Wigwam. I need to do a little business here with the folks at home and tell them about what's coming up on, okay. on Author's Voice. Um, well, thank you, and I'm honored sure. to be here. We'll be back here in just a second. But um, coming up on Author's Voice, uh, the next show in the pipeline is a, an episode of Stranger Than Fiction. It's our nonfiction uh, show. Host Dan Weinberg welcomes author and New Yorker cartoonist uh, Ken Crimstein to take your questions about Crimstein's new graphic novel, The Three Escapes of Hannah Arendt. This is a brilliant book. Uh, and that's coming up on September 25th at 3 p.m., the story of The Three Escapes of Hannah Arendt as a graphic novel. After that, Lit with Love, our host, Sonali Dave, welcomes author and producer Suzanne Brockman to discuss her new book and film, Out of Body. Uh, they are joined by the two lead actors in that film, all in town to attend the Reeling Film Festival. The Reeling Film Festival. So submit your questions for that show. That's Wednesday, September 26th at 2 p.m. Uh, lit with Love. 
ask a question, order signed books at authorsvoice.net. If you're watching this recorded after the live event, there will still be signed copies of Friends of the Wigwam available for you. You can buy it and we will ship it out to you. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube after the broadcast, of course, like I said before, you can still order those signed books. So we're reaching the end of our time. And for this broadcast, we've been talking about Friends of the Wigwam, a Civil War story. It comes to us from Barrington Group Publishers. The cost is $16.95. It's paperback and uh, comes from the pen of John Hulescamp. And uh, so thank you, John, and thank you, everybody at home, and we'll see you next time on Author's Voice.